Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History webinar series. I'm Marin. I'm your host for this webinar. Uh, please make sure that you have your video cameras and your mics turned off to ensure a good presentation free of distractions. Um, if you need any help or uh, you have any technical difficulties, feel free to use the chat option in Zoom. Um, and uh, if that's not working, you can email at FHL underscore webinars at BYU.edu. Next week, we'll be having a webinar with Joe Everett. He'll be giving a presentation on Scandinavian research, and that'll be on the 17th, Thursday at 3 p.m. So for January, um, today we have Catherine Grant, and she'll be going over adding sources for memories and third parties. This is uh, the the next installment of her Getting the Most Out of Family Search Family Tree series. Um, next week, we'll have Joe Everett with Scandinavian Research. And then after that, we'll have Olivia Jewell's presentation on everyday family history for the crazy busy life. And then we'll be hearing from James Tanner, and he'll be giving a presentation on super maximizing maps for genealogy. And I think that's all the announcements I have for now. Uh, but just make sure that you have your, um, your mics muted and your uh, videos, uh, video cameras disabled uh, so that we can have a smooth presentation. Um, today we'll be hearing from Catherine Grant and she's giving a presentation on um, on using, uh, on adding sources from memories and third parties. Uh, Catherine Grant is a teacher, writer, and family history enthusiast. She enjoys helping others build their family trees and believes that everyone can learn to do and love family history. Catherine teaches family classes at the BYU Family History Library and presents frequently at other family history events. Her column on family history ran in the Nauvoo Times for about a year and is still available online. Besides family history, she enjoys uplifting music, thought-provoking books, and making puns. And if Catherine is ready, uh, I'll turn the time over to her. So everybody, welcome. We're so glad to have you with us for this webinar today. And as Marin mentioned, this is another in our series of getting the most from Family Search Family Tree. And this particular webinar is about sources. And it's the third and last in a series, a little mini series that we've been doing on sources. So this particular one is going to uh, focus on adding third party sources in Family Search Family Tree. In order to give some context for today's webinar, I wanted to go back and just briefly review what we had talked about in the earlier webinars. So in the first webinar in this, in this series, we talked about sources in family history, just the basics, kind of a general overview of how and why sources are used. And then we talked about the sources tab on the person page in Family Tree. Part two was adding sources from Family Search historical records. And today is going to be part three, which is adding a memory as the source and also adding sources from other providers. So when I say other providers, I'm meaning not Family Search historical records. So that could include Ancestry, it could include Find a Grave, it could include the online parish clerks for England. Any site that offers genealogical sources that you might want to attach to somebody in Family Tree. So let's go ahead and look at how we can attach a memory as a source. In order to do that, I wanted to share with you an example. We've got here on the screen Eva Holland's death registration. Now, I ordered this from the GRO, and they sent me a PDF. And I want to add this as a, as a source to Eva Holland's tree, or, or excuse me, Eva Holland's record in Family Tree. So here's how we would do that. The first thing we do is go to Eva Holland's page and we click Sources. When we do that, we get to the Source tab and you'll see at the top of the source list, there's a button for adding a source. So we'll click Add Source. 
And then when we do that, we get this form that we need to fill out. You'll notice that there's already text in every field, but this is basically example text. And so it will kind of guide us as we go through and, and add the information that we want to add about this memory. But because that's kind of small to see, we're going to go ahead and take each piece separately and kind of blow it up so it's a little bit larger. So the first thing we do is give our source a title. And sometimes people feel a little intimidated by this. And I would just say, just uh, com let common sense be your guide and just add something that describes the record. It doesn't have to be lengthy, but it should be something that any user could look at it and say, oh, okay, I get that. And so in this case, just very simply, I mentioned the name of the person. And the reason I did that is I noticed that Family Search does that a lot with their sources. So I put the name first and then I just put what it is. It's a civil registration of death. In the next little section of that form, it's going to ask us if we want a web page URL or a memory. And I should comment here that this uh, procedure that we're going through or this uh, process is going to be exactly the same for a manual uh, source that you're adding based on a URL rather than a memory. The only part that's different is this little piece right here. So if you did want to add a URL, you just click web page URL and you'd paste in the URL. But here we want to add a memory. So we're, we click add a memory and then we get these two options here, which are to upload the memory or to select it from the gallery. So how do you tell which one you want to do? Well, if the document's on your computer, then you click upload memory. But if you've already added added it to your gallery in Family Search, then you would choose Select from Gallery. So for this example, the digital image is on my hard drive, and so we're going to choose Select, or excuse me, we're going to choose Upload Memory. So when you choose Upload Memory, you get a file listing, and it's going to look a little bit different depending on whether you're on Windows and which version of Windows, or whether you're on a Mac, but it's going to be some listing of files. So this is an example of my file listing in Windows 10, and I have navigated to the folder where I keep my GRO certificates, and we see here that we've got the PDF for Eva Holland. So I'm just going to go ahead and click on that to select it. And then you see it pops into the screen in the box where we were previously where we had clicked out of memory. You notice that it's got this bar across it right now that says unscreened. And that is because every memory that is added to Family Tree is screened for our protection because Family Search is a user friendly and a family friendly site. And as, as crazy as it seems, some people do sometimes up, try to upload stuff that's not appropriate. So they do screen it all, but it doesn't stop us from moving forward and completing the rest of the, the form to add our memory. And as soon as Family Search screens this, that little message will disappear. So the next piece is that we want to tell where the record is found. And again here, this can be intimidating to people. I think sometimes because we have nightmares of being in school and having our English teacher, you know, drag us over the coals because we weren't doing the sources right or whatever. But here again, my rule is common sense. Where the record is found, we just want to indicate in a very clear and straightforward way where somebody could go for a copy of this record if they wanted their own original. So I just put the name of the place where it's found, which is the General Register Office in Southport, England. And then I included a URL in case somebody wants to go there. That's not mandatory, but it seemed like it might be helpful to people. So we indicate where the record is found. And then in the next section, we describe the record. And again, doesn't have to be rocket science or anything, just very, something very simple to help people understand what the record is. The next thing we do is explain why we're attaching this memory as a source. And I feel really strongly about the importance of a good reason statement, because not only does it help other users, it will help you for several reasons. One of the reasons is that it kind of makes you think through 
why you want to attach this source. So that's a, you know an exercise in logic that can be actually really helpful. And then the other reason is I have to laugh about this. Sometimes I've attached a source, you know, at a, at a certain point, and then I come back years later, and I have no memory, no clear memory of why I attached the source or what it was going to prove. And so my reason statement helps me. It, it can help us as we are adding sources. So sometimes reason statements also can seem a little bit intimidating. And if you feel that way, you're not alone. And fortunately, we have a webinar on the BYU Family History webinar page that goes into a lot more detail about how to write good reason statements, effective reason statements. So if you want a little more information, just visit our webinar page and you'll get some help in that area. So the next section allows us to tag items that are in the source. And often Family Tree will pre-tag this for us because it will kind of know what the source is to a degree. And it will say, okay, it looks like this source probably includes a name, probably includes the sex, probably includes the death. If it doesn't pre-tag it, the user has complete control over these checkboxes. So you just check and uncheck whatever makes sense. And then where we actually covered where these tagged items show up in an earlier webinar. But just to review that, for instance, on this one, we've tagged this to the person's name. And if you were to go to the person page and you were to click on the name in the vital information section, this source would show up on the right hand side because it was tagged to the name. So that's a really nice feature that you can immediately see what sources pertain to what pieces of information for any particular person in Family Tree. The last thing before we click save is the option to add the source to your source box. And again, we went over that in an earlier webinar, but just briefly, the source box is a place in Family Tree where you can store copies of all your sources regardless of who they're attached to. I have to be honest, I actually don't use this much anymore. I used to keep all my sources in my source box, and then I discovered that I was Anytime I wanted to see a source, I looked at it in the context of a person. So instead of running to my source box and trying to find a source, I would virtually always go to the person's page and then click on the sources tab to see the source. So that's my the way I work. But honestly, I have friends who love the source box and keep all their stuff there. And that's how they organize their research. So what it comes down to really is what's most effective for you. So so just know that if you do choose to keep all your sources in your source box, this is the place where you do that. You click this and it will be automatically added to your source box in addition to being attached to the person. So when you've got everything the way you like it, you just click save and the memory, uh, the source rather that uses a memory is added to the top of your source list. Now that makes it easy to find once you've added it, but you may not want it to stay at the top of the list. For instance, suppose that you like to organize your sources in chronological order. Well, the death then obviously wouldn't be first, but Family Search makes it really easy to put the sources in whatever order you want. You just drag them. So in this case, I'm going to drag Eva Holland's registration of death down to the bottom, and now the sources are in chronological order. Now at this point, there's one other thing that we can do to enhance our source. And that is to tag it. Now we tagged it to pieces of information such as um, the name and the sex and so forth. But you can also tag a memory to people. So in this case, we would want to tag the source to Eva because it's about her, but we would also want to tag it to her parents because they also are mentioned in the death registration. So we're going to go ahead and click on the source title. And when we do, you notice that that message has gone away about the screening message. So by this point, the message is the, the memory has been accepted and it, no problem with it. So you want to click view memory 
And then when you do that, you get taken to this screen that might be familiar to a lot of you if you've added memories to anybody in Family Tree. And it's just a place where you can add more information. So here, I want to indicate that this record is about Eva Holland. So I go over here to the right side of the screen and I type in her name. At that point, Family Search looks for Eva Holland and it recognizes that I, and I'm not sure what all the algorithms are behind the scenes, but it recognized the right Eva Holland for me. So when I hit enter, it attached Eva Holland and you notice here it's got her PID and everything and I know that this is the right person. Now I would repeat the same process for her parents. Her mom's name is Mary Jean, Mary Jane McLean, and that might not be recognized as quickly. And so what happens if Family Tree doesn't recognize the person right away is it'll give you a list of possibilities and it'll give you the option to add the person just as text, not as somebody in Family Tree. So you basically just choose whatever is the right thing and then you hit enter, or, or excuse me, you click the right thing in this case when you've, when it hasn't unambiguously identified someone and then that person is also tagged. And I'm not gonna walk through because it's just basically the same process here. In other words, I'm not gonna walk through the parents as well as Eva. Another thing that you can do that I love is to add some additional detail here. As you look at that death registration, is that handwriting very easy to read? Well, for one thing, it's kind of small, right? But old handwriting often can be a challenge for any of us to read. So you can make it easier for people who come to this memory by adding the information in a typewritten format. So we can go over here and click add for the date, add for the place, add for the description, and just type in that information. And that just makes it a lot easier for anybody who's looking at this memory. So that concludes, um, excuse me, that concludes how to add a memory as a source. And now we're ready to look at how we add sources from other providers. So my favorite way to add sources from other providers is to use an app called RecordSeek. I absolutely love this. When they say here on the screen that it records a website with virtually no, sort, no, no effort as a source, they're not kidding. I have never found an easier way to attach a non-family search source. So the first thing that you want to do is you drag this button, this record seek button, excuse me, up to your bookmark bar. Now the trickiest part about doing that is that the bookmark bar may not be visible in your browser because everybody has different browser settings, right? So what, what you want to do, every browser is different, and so I'm not going to talk about instructions for every browser to make your bookmark bar visible, but I would say just Google it. And then once your bookmark bar is visible, you'll be able to drag this button up to the bookmark bar, and then when you do, you'll get a button up there and that button will remain visible regardless of what source or excuse me regardless of what site you're on and that's what makes it so easy to use record site record seek to attach a source from any site so here's an example this is a source for a, a marriage record for thomas joshua gunton that i found in ancestry and i did want to make a quick comment here that if a source is available in Family Search Historical Records, I'll use that one instead of using a source from another provider. The main reason for that is that Family Search guarantees that their links aren't going to break. Well, as much as any human can. And so the, the source links in Family Search Historical Records are definitely the most reliable and the most trustworthy. So if I have my option, if a record appears both on Ancestry and in Family Search Historical Records, I'll use the Family Search version. But in this particular case, the record didn't appear in Family Search Historical Records, at least at the time that I searched for it. Of course, they're always adding things. But the record did appear in Ancestry. So I went over to Ancestry to begin the process of attaching it using RecordSeq. So let's just walk through that. 
So the first step, of course, as we said, is to go to the source that you want to attach. And this can be any source, find a grave, online parish clerk, whatever it is. You just navigate to that page and then you click record seek. And it brings up a page, and this sometimes I've noticed is a little bit confusing for people because it lists two options down here, Family Search or Ancestry. Well, people wonder, are you asking where the source is coming from or are you asking where I want to attach it to? Well, they're asking where you want to attach the source to. So in this case, I want to attach it to a person page in Family Tree, so I'm going to click Family Search. Once I do that, I get this form, and you notice that it's filled it all out for me, and that's why they say create a source with virtually no effort. The app just crawls the page and looks at the information and populates it into what it thinks are the right areas. Now, once in a while, they'll populate something and you'll look at it and go, oh, that doesn't make sense. But this whole thing is editable. So anytime that something is populated incorrectly, you can just change it. Another note down here where we see in Describe the Record, they've put source created by recordseek.com. Well, that doesn't exactly describe the record, but I understand why they aren't able to describe every record for all the hundreds of genealogical sites that any user might go to. So in this field, I normally will add a description of the record. I'll keep this statement by record C because I think it's good for people to know how the source was created. But before it, I'll add a, a brief description. If the site I'm on offers a brief description, often I'll just copy and paste that right in. But otherwise, I'll just write a brief description. And then, oh, one thing I did want to mention about this, you, you remember, let me pop back up here. On the original screen, it says that you can drag the bookmark or you can use one of these browser extensions. I prefer to use the bookmark and use the button up here on the bookmark bar because when I've used the Chrome extension, let's get back to where we were, it skips this screen and it doesn't allow me to review it. Now, I don't know if that's a bug that's going to be fixed. I should probably email the person who made this and ask the developer and ask them or whether that's intentional. But be that as it may, that's a reason why at least currently I prefer not to use the browser extension, but I prefer to drag the button to the bookmark bar and do it that way. So I look over this, I make sure it's okay, and then I, oh yeah, here we've got a little message, so you review the captured information, make any necessary changes, and then click next. And then we come to the place where RecordSeq is saying, great, now wh who do you want to attach this source to? Well, you notice up here at the top, they've got search fields and you can search, but honestly, it's faster in my mind and easier just to choose the PID from FamilySearch and it's not ambiguous at all. I mean, that absolutely identifies the person. So I will pop over to back to family search and I will click on the PID. And this is a pretty new feature and I absolutely love it. When you click on the PID, you're gonna get this little bubble pop up and it's going to let you copy the ID. So you just click that. And when you do, it's put it in the memory of your computer. And then you just go down to this field and you paste it in. Simple as that. So as soon as it's pasted in, then RecordSeq knows where to attach the source and you click Next. After you click Next, you've got the opportunity to tag this source. And when you click the Tag button, you get exactly the same options that we saw in Family Tree. So it's just the same thing and the tags will show up in Family Tree exactly the same way as if you'd click them there. So we, we click the things that this source applies to and then we click Close. And then we're back to my favorite, the reason statement. Now, one small caution I would use here, I am sure that the person who put these sample statements here was, was wanting to be helpful, but these are actually probably not the best example of reason statements. And so I wouldn't 
I wouldn't rely on those uh, examples for your reason statement. Uh, for instance, you can see the, the bottom one says, I'm not sure if this is correct, more research is needed. Well, let me make a comment about that. Uh, and you might have heard this too at Roots Tech or so forth. Robert Kerr, who used to be the manager of search, mentioned that when you add a source to somebody in Family Tree, you're basically telling the system more about that person. So Family Tree will use that source to find more sources for the individual. Well, if we attach a source that's not really for that person, it's going to mess up the hinting. It's going to give you uh, more hints uh, that are similar to the hint you attached. And if that's not for that person, it's going to give us bogus hints. So we don't ever want to attach a source in Family Tree unless we're really confident that it's for that person. So I just wanted to give one example of why I would say don't rely on these examples. But again, if you are interested in more information on writing effective reason statements, check out the webinar on the BYU Family History webinar page. So after you've added your reason statement, then you click create and attach and you get a confirmation message that says congratulations, the source has been added. Now here's one little trick about adding a source with Record Seek. When you go back to Family Search, or excuse me, to Family Tree and you look on the source page, the source is not going to show up there right away. You have to refresh the page. So once you refresh the page, you will see the source up here at the top. Notice that this again has got a different icon. So this has got a globe icon indicating that this is a source from another website, whereas you remember that uh, scrapbook icon indicated that it was a source that used a memory. And again, we've got the trees down here that indicate these are sources from Family Search historical records. And once again, I prefer my sources in chronological order. So I'm not going to leave this one first, but I'm going to drag it so that it's reordered down to the bottom of the screen or bottom of the source list. So that brings us to the end of our webinar today. We talked about how to add a memory as the source using that example of a, of a PDF death registration. And then we also talked about how to use Record Seek to add a source from a non Family Search provider. So thank you very much for joining us today. And Marin, do we have any questions? Uh, I don't see any in the chat box right now, but if anyone has questions, feel free to type those in. Um, to answer the question, does Record Seek work with Mac computers? It does. And is using Record Seek a, th a thinly way to add third party sources? I'm if I'm reading that question correctly, uh, I would say it's just an easy way to do it. And so I, I'm not sure what is meant by thinly, but, but yeah, it's just a really easy way to add sources rather than having to type all that information manually. Oh, only, thank you. Yeah, it, it, and it actually isn't the only way. I have never seen another app quite like that, but you can type the information manually. You'd use the same process that we used by um, when we added the memory. So, and Laura Lee, yes, Laura Lee, I hope I said your name correctly. And yes, absolutely, you're welcome to, to view the previous webinars. Just go to the Family History Library website and there's a webinar page where all the webinars are listed. Honestly, the easiest way to find it for me rather than navigating to it is just to Google BYU FHL for Family History Library, BYU FHL webinars. Okay, I see a question from Anna Lee. What is the difference between describe the record and the reason statement? That is a fantastic question. So in describing the record, you're basically just telling what the record is. So is it a death record? Is it a marriage record? That type of thing. The reason statement gives a user information as to why you thought it was valuable to attach that record. So for instance, for a census, I would say this record provides evidence of a residence, of the birthplace, of the birth, approximate birth year, and of family relationships. So basically, that it's just uh, 
in the reason statement, you're trying to show why it was valuable for you to attach that source. How do you attain that? How do you attain the app? Go to recordseek.com. So it's just all one word, R-E-C-O-R-D-S-E-E-K.com. And thank you, Laura Lee, Laura Lay. I don't, I'm glad I came sort of close with your name. So um, George says, if you use the compare feature from Ancestry to Family Search, then later Family Search will later show it as a research source. What should I do then? Because you have the source listed twice. Great question. I wondered if that would come up. I actually have when I've used sources transferring from Ancestry to Family Search, yeah, that 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 can be a common problem. So I yeah, I'm sorry. I was gonna go into more detail, but I don't think it's necessary. So anyway, what you can do is just go into the source list and you can detach the source. So there is, there's an option that, you know, just imagine in your mind that you're seeing that list of sources. You click on the source title and then a box will open up and one of the options will be detach. Laura Lai. Thank you, Laura Lai. That's a beautiful name. So kudos to your sweet dad. And thank you, everybody, for the kind words. I really appreciate it and appreciate you so much being here today. Can we print the slides from these presentations? You could, but actually what might be an easier thing to do, let me see if I can move this chat box, is if you go to this URL right here, there, I actually haven't added it yet, so I give me a, um, probably a day to add it because after I leave here, I'm going to another presentation. Sorry, otherwise I would have added it immediately. But maybe give me till tonight or tomorrow, and then if you go to this tinyurl.com slash fh hyphen resources, that has links to all the slide decks for my um, presentations, and they're just free for use. You're welcome to copy them. You're welcome to change them and to use them in your own training or whatever. So yeah, go to that URL, and by tonight or tomorrow, I will have a link to this latest webinar. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for your comments. Um, we appreciate your participation today. Um, I'm going to switch over to the closing screen and I'll just share uh, closing announcements. And it sounds like someone has their microphone on in the background. So if you just could make sure that your mics are off, that would be appreciated. Um, so next week we'll have a webinar with Joe Everett. He uh, is the librarian here at the BYU Family History Library. Um, and he'll be uh, sharing uh, with us more about Scandinavian research. Um, and then, so that will be at 3 p.m. Uh, Mountain Time on the 17th. And then next week, uh, we'll have a presentation with Olivia Jewell. Uh, I mean, the preceding week after the 17th, we'll have uh, a presentation from Olivia Jewell and then a presentation from James Tanner on the 31st. Uh, thank you so much, and we hope that you have a wonderful weekend and hope to see you next Thursday. Thank you.